Hi everyone, I'm Pan Olén and I recently joined Vaxium Biotech. It's a Danish artificial intelligence immunotherapy company listed on Nasdaq New York. So why? Well, Avaxion is doing something truly unique. We are developing personalized cancer immunotherapies, drugs tailored for each cancer patient. So we in fact produce and make a new drug for every patient. And you may ask yourself, what's the sense in doing that? Well, if we can do what we aim to do to prolong survival of cancer patients, it makes every sense. Let's take a look at, look at Avaxion. We have some forward-looking statements. Yes, we are listed in the US. And we're heavily insured too, and I don't take that personally. Let's look at Avaxion then. We were founded in 2008 as an artificial intelligence company. The two founders basically spent the first six years in a cellar without salary. In 2014, it started to become a biotech company based on novel targets discovered through the artificial intelligence platform. And with these targets, we have today a public artificial intelligence immunotherapy company, about 70 people. We have three leading artificial intelligence platforms for target discovery in oncology and in infectious disease, and a solid clinical pipeline with personalized cancer immunotherapies, the lead product today in clinical phase 2B. So, why do we use artificial intelligence for drug development? Well, it's not for drug development, it's for drug discovery. So this is a drug discovery engine. We take the targets and then we develop them through the biotech entity. But again, why artificial intelligence? Because we need to optimize a drug for each patient. And again, artificial intelligence is there because it's so complex. On the one hand, we have the tumor, on the other, the immune system, and the effect of immunotherapy is dependent on the interface between the tumor and the immune system. And the tumor is unique for each patient. It's made from hundreds or even thousands of random mutations. And you can see the complexity and variability. And they, these have to be detected by the immune cells, and the patients also have a unique immune, immune system. So the interface becomes extremely complex. And that's really why we use artificial intelligence. And how do we do it? Let's take a look. It starts with a biopsy. We take a biopsy from the tumor sequence, and then identify mutations. And we do that by also having a control sequence from healthy tissue, and then you can see the differences. In addition, we take a blood sample, and we profile the immune system, and then we match the mutations to the immune system and see if it's likely if those mutations will fit into the receptors of the immune cells. We also look for RNA to see the level of expression, to see if those new antigens are really expressed, and to a level that can induce an immune response. So we feed all this data into the AI system, we get a prediction, the AI system ranks all the mutations and selects the ones most likely to induce a strong immune activation. Then we send those for manufacturing, then we treat the patient, and then hopefully we have an effect, and we actually do have an effect. Let's take a look at the first trial. So this evx one is a peptide-based vaccine. It's a study in metastatic melanoma. It's a phase 1-2A study. Uh, and what we present here is interim data from the first nine patients. So these are patients at the end stage of their disease. They have received every conceivable therapy. Half of them already received PD-1 inhibition, and they have not had a response. So then, then that's when they joined the study. Zero line here is if the tumor burden is stable, and if it increases, these are patients where tumor burden increases, and if it goes down, you have a reduction. So these first patients, you would expect tumors to increase. We start treatment with EVX01, and then we follow it up for six and 12 months, and what you can see is six out of nine patients, we actually have a dramatic reduction in tumor burden. Two of them complete responders. This is really promising, and that, le that led us to start another trial. It's already ongoing, 
a, a, sorry, first a patient case. Here is one of the patients from the trial. It's a 64-year-old woman with metastatic melanoma. She's been treated with Keytruda PD-1 for 10 months, stable disease. Then we give EVX01. We take a biopsy from tumors and give EVX01. And this is before starting EVX01. Here is one of the key tumors. That's before treatment, and then one year after treatment, and it's still completely gone. So it's not only a response, it's also long-lasting. And this is a very clear result, and it shows us we do have an effect. So we started a phase 2B trial. This is a global trial in Australia, Europe, and the US. We are opening 25 sites, including about 80 patients, and we will have an interim result from this trial in second half next year. It's a combination trial, so we have a supply agreement with Merck on Keytruda, and they will deliver Keytruda for all patients, and they've also been heavily involved in the design of this trial. Uh, so we are, of course, very, uh, waiting for that very important readout in the next autumn. This is a peptide-based platform, but as you know, technologies evolve, and we also have developed a new technology, which is DNA-based. And let's look at that. We have another trial ongoing. It's called EVX02. It's also personalized cancer immunotherapy. It's a combination treatment with nivolumab. It's another PD-1 inhibitor. And this is melanoma patients after resection. So complete resection of the tumor burden. Then we start treatment. And the objective here is basically to avoid recurrence or relapse of disease. So as you can imagine, this is a long-term trial where clinical results will come much later. But what we can get early on is safety and proof of mechanism. Since it's a new delivery modality, it's very important to show that it works. And what you see here is the treatment is DNA plasmid. We have added about 20 neoantigens into the plasmid. Then we inject these DNA plasmids into patients. And in order to get an effect, the DNA must be taken up into the nucleus of cells. We need to produce the neoantigens inside the cells of the body, and that needs to raise an immune system specific to the neoantigens. So that's the kind of data we can get. And we actually have demonstrated that very clearly. So not only well tolerated, but we do get a neoantigen-specific T cell response in all patients. It's robust and it's long-lasting, so a strong proof of mechanism. And you could think that this will lead us to invest very heavily in this trial. Well, we will continue the trial, but we have already developed the next generation platform. And that is a uh, DNA plasmid armed with an immune activating entity. It's called EVX03. And what we do here is, of course, same as in EVX02. We have the neoantigens, but in addition, we add on immune activating agents that attract the antigen-presenting cells and make sure that they're presented in a much more efficient way. And that's how we get a much stronger immune reaction. And in our hands, this new modality is far superior to existing technologies. So let's look at our pipeline. What we're going to do here, the phase one, uh, phase 2B trial is ongoing for the peptide-based platform. There we, of course, are looking to show clinical efficacy and sign an out-licensing agreement in time. But right now we are running a, this phase one study with EVX02, but the IED is to move over to EVX03 and try to skip as much as phase one as possible because we are quite sure we will get same kind of safety risks with EVX03 as EVX02. So we think we can go very quickly through phase one and into phase two with this new platform. As you can see, we also have infectious disease, and we have three AI platforms. Pioneer is for cancer, Eden and Raven is for bacteria and viruses. And it's not time to go through how these platforms work. I can just say they are used to discover novel targets based on pattern recognition, basically, and how they fit with the immune system. Uh, we have already novel targets for Staph aureus. And the idea is, of course, to treat Staph aureus, which is antibiotic-resistant. Same for gonorrhea 
and then we are just about to be, become public with the first viral target. But we are a rather small company, so the idea is to partner these early and focus our resources on the clinical programs. And the business model is out licensing. We do discovery and early development in-house. Then we try to sign partnerships agreements and finance a company through upfront payments, milestones along the development, and then in the end, potential royalties if the partner succeeds in bringing it to the market. And can we outlicense? Well, at least it's a growing market. Immunotherapies is a huge market, closing in on 300 billion in 2030. There's also a number of quite high profile deals within personalized cancer immunotherapy in the last few years. The first one was by BMS. Um, acquiring a part of uh, or signing a deal with Gridstone. We have Roche teaming up with Nycode. Then there's BioNTech teaming up with Neon. And we have Merck teaming up with Moderna. And these are actually the four competitors out there. So we are one which is still looking for a partnership, but we have probably the world leading AI platforms. So we think we are a really good position for that. So just to finish off, Upcoming milestones, we are launching a viral uh, target for a, a viral vaccine very soon, end of this year. Then in the first half, we are presenting the full data on EVXO2, and in the autumn next year, the phase to be interim data of EVXO1. And when it comes to financing, yes, it's difficult markets. We have about 18 million US dollars in the bank. Uh, that will take us approximately to mid next year. But in addition, we have financial vehicles in place, so we can draw another 40 million US dollars if needed, but we hope to be able to avoid that through other ways. So just to finish off, we have today leading AI platforms. We have a novel next generation DNA uh, technology for uh, delivery. And with that, we're aiming to become a leader when it comes to truly personalized and life-saving cancer vaccines. So, thanks so much. Thank you, Per, and excellent timekeeping, may I add. Thank you. So, do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested to uh, learn more about your AI models. You said a bit about prediction, but could you elaborate a bit? Yes, absolutely. So um, one factor is, of course, the immune system. And there are many subfamilies on receptors. So we need to demonstrate if the new antigens, or the new epitopes, rather, if they fit into these receptors. So we have MHC1, we have MHC2, and we have different subfamilies. And we want, of course, both an MHC1 and MHC2 uh, fit, because then we can get both CD8 and CD4 cells. So it's uh, about... Um, trying to identify sequences with the right length that can fit in, in uh, MAC2 and MAC1. And you have longer sequences for MAC2, so, and then you can cut them down so the same will also fit in MAC1. So the complexity of predicting what kind of epitopes will have the best fit overall, and in that specific patient population, that becomes extremely complex. And then we have a lot of other factors as well, like uh, RNA expression. So are they expressed when we start? If they are not expressed, we can't raise an immune uh, reaction anyway. If they are expressed highly from the start, well, then we found that we actually can't add so much more by uh, uh, giving more product and so on. So it's a lot of fact. And we have seven different variables that we tighter and try to optimize and then do ranking. So it's a self-learning system as well. We all can always check with the kind of immune response we get. Do we get T cell, uh, CD4, CD8, and then we try to match that to a perfect. We want mainly CD8, but we also want CD4 to get a strong response. AI-driven drug discovery and immunotherapy checks two pretty hot boxes right now, and uh, also US listed. Um, could you say anything about the interest that you've seen so far from uh, well, from the big players in the industry. Yeah, we, we do have discussions. And uh, there are a lot of complexities here, of course, because uh, the most unique part of the company is the AI prediction system. 
And of course, we don't want to outlicense the core of the company. So it's about finding a model where a partner get access to a product, or is it a product even? It's a mo method for treating patients. Uh, so that's the kind of discussions that get, get complex. But we can uh, define uh, indications or therapy areas or uh, regions, so it, it is uh, definitely possible to do. And uh, uh, we have uh, historically been very reluctant to enter partnerships, but that is changing now, and I think it has to do with the market as well, because today money is much more expensive than it was a few years ago, and now it makes more sense to enter partnerships and to get by that way. So we are focusing much more on uh, and starting up business development really right now haven't been so much activities previously. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a very interesting technical uh, solution, uh, Pat, uh, and I'm curious, uh, since it's a very personalized approach, um, what about scalability of the product and also how, how do you um, relate to pricing? Yeah, that, that is a very important question. Uh, so we invest quite a lot in making uh, the process streamlined. Of course, we as a small company can't make this extremely efficient. We have come down to a full timeline of about two months from biopsy to actually giving the injection. Uh, but that involves uh, today uh, in our hands six different CROs and they all contribute with their part for one patient at a time. So of course it's very uh, difficult contracts to establish. It's not the ideal contract for a CRO. But obviously if you take this in-house and especially if we can go to the next platform, the DNA platform, we are developing a synthetic version of that, so we can do it all in a machine in the end. We can't do that ourselves, but we have found a process to do it. So it's definite, definitely possible for a big pharma to develop this in a way where you can make it scalable and where you can do it in, say, two weeks. But it will take a few years. Do you have, for the adjuvant setting, do you have any criteria where, do, where you would exclude patients from inclusion in the clinical trial? I'm thinking about any immune-related criteria, if you have that, and then also why, and then I also have a question on, on the T-cell response, because you said it was robust. Um, so have you seen a lot of difference between patients when you look at the kinetics and the specificity, because you said there were 20 epitopes? Yes, no, th th these are all good questions, and um, uh, what we can say is um, there is a lot of, uh, still we have a very strong predictions uh, in the case that we do get uh, to most of the epitopes in most patients, but that means also that we need to select patients where there is a lot of mutations. So that's one of the reasons we started with melanoma. Melanoma is likely not the final commercial indication. Uh, that's, of course, we, in the next trial we go for lung cancer. But uh, we are dependent still on having tumors with uh, reasonably high uh, mutational burden uh, in order to find enough uh, strong epitopes. So that is one criteria that we need to match. And then in some patients we get a stronger CD8, in some a stronger CD4, and that's continuous improvement in this prediction platform. So the platform is stronger than two years ago, and uh, again, it will be stronger in two years from now. Is, is your prediction model generalizable to other population, assuming that you are having homo a homogeneous population on which you are training on currently now? Um, if I understand it correctly, on the, on, if the question is on how we train the model, uh, then uh, there is uh, mainly on structural alignment. So those, uh, what we do is we predict a structure out of a 9 mirror peptide, and then how that would fit into the structure of the, expect, the HLA subtype you have in that patient. So we actually can, uh, even if we don't have the final outcome data, like uh, uh, complete response or not, we can, if we do have the immune response data that we get a specific CD4 or CD8 response, we can get uh, a coupling that we can train the machine, uh, the machine learning with. So. Um, so it's for each patient. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Yep.